Hello everyone, welcome to the fourth uh, edition of the Dissident Live here in uh, Paka Zuzeiger. Uh, we're really happy to see you here. Um, we worked very hard uh, to hopefully, uh, to uh, hope a very, hopefully a very interesting and uh, um, relevant evening. We have four fantastic guests. Um, two of them, or one of them actually, unfortunately, um, is here present with us, and the other one in, uh, had to cancel. Um, but I will elaborate that on that a little bit later. Uh, but we have also two guests on the ground, one in Bahrain, Nabil Rajab, and the other one, Odi Agev in Nigeria. Um, we are uh, Freek Schermer, and I am Emma Smith, and we are working at uh, World Talks. We've been working at this project for, uh, well, for me personally, a little bit more than a year now. Uh, in the back over there is Menno van der Veen. He is the founding father of the project. Um, it's the first time that he is not presenting, but I'm sure we will hear from him later on. <laughs> uh, and I would also really like to invite you to uh, get involved into this discussion as much as possible, because that's uh, what we aim to do here. We want to create a conversation um, on several continents uh, with all input that uh, we can get. Um, so, as you see, it's a rather intimate setting, and this also, uh, well, makes it easier for you to just raise up your hand and we can just, uh, so we can get your questions into the conversation. So, for those of you who are here for the first time or uh, at an event of us for the first time, what is World Talks? Um, as I said, it's an online platform for human rights defenders worldwide. We've been uh, doing this for a little bit more than more than a year now. And we have started with uh, Skype interviews. Um, so that has been our main objective for some time. Uh, we've conducted Skype interviews with people from all over the world. Um, and we have uh, edited these interviews and uh, spread them on our social media. In addition to that, we also organize public events, such as this one tonight. Um, and we have recently started um, with a local television program in which we seek to establish a connection between the um, big international human rights themes that we discuss in our interviews and the local level here in Amsterdam. So what is the meaning of these? Like it, it also, um, it's easy to sort of view these issues as a very faraway problem but by uh, discussing these issues with, um, well, noted Amsterdam citizens, we, um, we try to establish a connection, and that's why we call it the most global television show on this planet. And we al always work with themes. So tonight, the theme that, is that we are going to discuss is the last generation. And this term was first coined um, to refer to the people that were born a little bit before World War I. And um, now, 100 years later, it's becoming very relevant again. And uh, in fact, it's been called one of the big problems of our time. Um, for the record, lost here doesn't mean vanished, but rather um, disoriented, dis uh, disillusioned, wandering, directionless may sound familiar to some of you. Um, we are in our 20s, 30s, and, uh, but it's a universal problem. Um, here in the West, we tend to see it, or in Europe, um, well, I think if we are not in a position ourselves, we know someone that is looking for a job or uh, having problems finding housing, et cetera, et cetera. Like, in general, what are we to do with our lives? How can we give it meaning, et cetera? just trying to figure out life. Um, but tonight, we will not focus on ourselves. Tonight, we're taking it a step further because just imagine um, while trying to figure out what you want to do in life um, and thinking about jobs, etc. Uh, on top of these things, there's also 
uh, grave violation of your human rights, lack of democracy, um, you name it, homophobia, all things, uh, war. So in that situation, how are you going to establish yourself? How are you going to uh, develop yourself? That is what we want to focus on. And we will do that um, by focusing on two countries, Bahrain and Nigeria, uh, which, uh, well, at first hand you don't think there are parallels between them, they're very different countries, but um, tonight we will, we will try to, well, at least we will have in-depth discussions about both countries and see if there are overarching uh, trends or problems or issues that uh, we can maybe all relate to. So, um, who are we going to discuss this with? As said, we have, well, we have now three guests, uh, but very, very interesting guests. Uh, we will first, or Craig will interview Nabil Rajab, a very uh, prominent human rights advocate uh, who is now in Bahrain. Then we have Patan Bushiri, Bushiri, who is here with us, uh, also originally from Bahrain, but currently living in Amsterdam and studying in Amsterdam. And then uh, we will um, call uh, or Skype Odi Agev, who is at this moment in Nigeria. He is also Nigerian. Um, so then we will discuss how the, situ how the situation is for the 2030 people, tw people in the 2030s in Nigeria. Uh, Freik? So yeah, we will we will first go to uh, to Bahrain. Um, it's a small kingdom uh, in the Persian Gulf, around one and a half million uh, inhabitants. Um, in 2011, it was this, it was one of the sites uh, where the, the so-called Arab Spring took place. Uh, there was a big protest there um, for more democracy and against violations of, of uh, violation of human rights. The government there basically crushed the protest. Um, many, many have died and many were imprisoned. Um, international media basically abandoned uh, Bahrain during that time. There was only one media channel that, um, that remained, it was Al Jazeera, and based on the, based on the protest, they made, uh, made a documentary film. Uh, I encourage you definitely to go, to go watch it. We cannot, uh, we cannot show the full movie here because it's, uh, because it's an hour long. Um, it's called shouting in the dark, and we will show the, We will first show the trailer, and after that we will, oh, and after that we will uh, have a, a Skype interview with um, Nabil Nabil Rajab, and we will focus again on the on the the documentary film. So it's five minutes, and after that we will skip to the Skype Skype interview. Bahrain, an island kingdom in the Arabian Gulf, where the Shia Muslim majority are ruled by a family from the Sunni minority, where people fighting for democratic rights broke the barriers of fear, only to find themselves alone and crushed. This is their story, and Al Jazeera is their witness. The only TV journalist who remained to follow their journey of hope to the carnage that followed. This is the Arab revolution that was abandoned by the Arabs, forsaken by the West, and forgotten by the world. Tens of thousands had come to Pearl Roundabout in the heart of the capital to call for democracy. They went to bed that night in the street, believing they were already free. At 3 a.m., the government moved to evict sleeping protesters from Pearl Roundabout. Police swarmed the camp with shotguns and clubs. Anyone too slow or injured to run 
was beaten by police. <laughs> At Salmania, the country's main hospital, the aftermath was on view. Hundreds of protesters were shot, tear gassed, and beaten with rifle butts. As distraught family members flooded in, doctors and nurses broke down. Overcome by the scenes of violence, that shocked this small Gulf nation. For hours, the hospital's ambulances were prevented from reaching protesters who were injured and dying. Any uniformed medic caught trying to save protesters at Pearl Roundabout was attacked. Dr. Sadiq El Ekri, a senior surgeon, was handcuffed and beaten. I was wearing the uniform for the doctors, you know, that one with the, with the, with the crescent. Then they tie me and they attack me while I'm tying. Then I don't know how many people, maybe 10, maybe 20. I don't remember. I'm, I'm here from everywhere I was here and hit by sticks, by legs. I don't know, I don't know what they, then they, they told me get up the wall, we'll kill you. My brother, he was asleep next to the run the boat. Then the, the policeman, he's coming, then they shoot him when he was asleep. He's going there because he's looking for work. He's only 22 years. You see what they did in this man. See, see what they did. See what they did in this man also. He let all people sleep, then he's coming, he's shooting by gun, he's using gun, for animals, he's, he's using for a human. Thousands attended funerals for the four who died at Pearl Roundabout. No one was ready to give up. The funeral marches turned into protest marches, headed back to Pearl Roundabout. Once again, peaceful protesters faced government bullets, this time from the army. At Salmania Hospital, the cycle began again. As if we are in a war, it's chaos. The hospital is full of casualties. All the medical staff are running on their feet. Dr. Ghassan Daif appealed to the world on Al Jazeera. Everybody in the world, United States, European Union, all the Arab leagues, all the Arab countries, please do come here to help us. These are just innocent demonstrators. It's unbelievable. Expelled from Pearl Roundabout, thousands now gathered in front of Salmania. It had been a humanitarian refuge. Now its car park would give refuge to protests, which only grew larger and more emotional with the arrival of each new injury. So that's quite, uh, quite special, I would say. Um, yeah, of course, we all know where it is, but for those that uh, forgot uh, for now, it's, uh, it's a tiny uh, country next to, uh, next to Saudi Arabia. Um, and I hope to get some, get some answers about uh, the aspect of journalism uh, later on when I'm, uh, when I'm speaking with you. Uh, why, why this has been uh, abandoned, basically, and what has changed ever, uh, since? But first, I'm going to try to get a, get a connection with um, uh, Nabil Rajab. Um, he should be waiting for us. Yeah, so he's, uh, he's the president of the... Uh, Hello, 
Hi. Hi. Hello. Can you can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. All right. Um. Well, welcome here. Uh, wait, we don't have a we don't have a screen. How is this possible? Uh, let me try to reconnect it. One minute. Here we go. So it's always uh, technical stuff that uh, seems to uh, abandon us. <laughs> yeah, we'll take uh, we'll take a minute. Um, in the meantime, uh, Nabil Rajab, he's uh, he's a prominent uh, human rights uh, activist. Uh, uh, advocate for uh, for uh, democracy in uh, in Bahrain has been imprisoned several times, uh, also after the 2011 protests. Um, he actually is he set up several organizations in uh, in Bahrain dealing with human rights, dealing with uh, with uh, democracy. He's a deputy secretary general of the International Federation Federation um, a Foundation, sorry, of Human Rights, and. Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, welcome here. Um, everybody's uh, everybody's watching. Um, you can only see me because the, the screen is pointed my way, not towards the towards the audience. But uh, uh, just assume that there's uh, that there's an audience here. <laughs> um, so I was just uh, I was just explaining uh, who you are. Um, uh, yeah, intru introduce yourself for uh, for me. I think you must be a lot better at it uh, than I am. <laughs> Well, first of all, do I sound okay speaking? Uh, is it still sound okay? Yeah, 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 good. Good, okay. My name is Nabil Rajab. I am a, a human rights activist. Uh, been an activist in this country, in the region, and internationally in the past 20 years. I'm the head of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights now. The founder, mm -hmm. one of the founder, as well as um, uh, one of the founder of the Gulf Center for Human Rights, yeah. that's based yeah. in Beirut. I work with Human Rights Watch in the board of advisor. I work in, with the International Federation for Human Rights as uh, Deputy Secretary General. I work with many uh, international human rights groups, directly, indirectly, or indirectly. Uh, I'm an activist uh, in the social media as well. Uh, I spent the majority of my five, past five years in jail, uh, uh, almost uh, 30 months uh, in the past four years I spent in jail because of the work that I do, because of a tweet that I made. I'm in Bahrain now, uh, released uh, last July, but uh, I still have cases pending. And I'm banned from traveling. I'm not allowed to speak. I'm not allowed to take part in a uh, peaceful gathering, peaceful protest, as well as the whole nation in this part of the world. Don't have the right to gather, don't have the right to talk, don't have the right to criticize. But this is the uh, challenges that we have as a human rights movement, people in this part of the world. Work, working under very difficult, complicated, dangerous circumstances yeah. Yeah. with the regime that doesn't respect rights, ruled by repressive regimes in the country 
as well as the whole region. And uh, with the country that nobody wants to anger because we consider to be a part of the rich uh, region that a lot of uh, Western countries, including your country, that depend on the oil, the arms sales, and a lot of business investment. So uh, the, I'm from a country that you don't hear much about the human right, the level of human rights violation and, and crime committed here against human rights because of we are a rich country that our government could silence the international community and could silence the media. The media that is owned by the rulers, by the ruling families, or could be influenced by the ruling families in the region. So the only way that we could talk through Twitter and through Facebook. And now, majority of my colleagues who have been an activist on Twitter and Facebook are in jail, sentenced from six months to up to 200 years. And uh, a majority of them are in exile, and uh, thousands of uh, prisoners we have in jail. I'm from a country that considered to be the highest, uh, has the highest number of political prisoners. We are almost over half a million local population, and we have 4,000 political prisoners. We have uh, at least 20,000 went in and out jail in the past. Uh, five years. We have children behind bar being tortured. We have a lot of people tortured to death. We are in a country that considered to be non-free country, according to Freedom House annual report. And we are uh, from a country that considered to be by reporter without border as the enemy of the internet. For the uh, for the uh, targeting. Uh, uh, activists on the internet and social media. Uh, we are uh, also um, from a country uh, which is considered to be one of the worst 20 countries in the world when it comes to the level of respect for freedom of expression. Uh, I'm in a country that you are not allowed to speak, you are not allowed to criticize. So in that difficult uh, circumstances I'm trying to summarize I'm working on. So you can go ahead with your question and I would love to see your audience, but if not, yeah. but I could uh, feel good when I see people talking to me directly. I mean, your face looks good, but still, <laughs> it looks yeah, yeah, it's I, 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 would, I would love to turn the, turn the screen around, but when I did it, uh, tried to do it a few minutes ago, the, the screen popped out, so I don't get affected anymore. Um, um, but, you, but you were saying in, uh, in the beginning, um, you said you are not, not allowed, to, allowed to talk. Um, you're basically uh, in the Netherlands on a live stream with a large audience. Is this, is this problematic what you're doing? Well, yes, I'm talking to you as a problematic, and it is a gambling. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, but challenges that somebody has to take, costs that somebody are willing or should be willing to pay for a better future for our next generation. Yeah. All countries, including your country, there are always people who fought for freedom once upon a time in history for you to have a better society that respects human rights and apply justice. So maybe we are passing that stage that you have passed maybe three, four, five, six hundred years ago. And, uh, but we are in a difficult little bit situation, uh, different than yours. Uh, because we are living in a rich country that nobody can see what is happening in here. Go ahead. Lost generation, uh, a less uh, less positive uh, term, I guess. I guess. Um, is, 
is the generation with, with dreams and aspirations, yet at the same time um, deprived of many, many possibilities. I mean, every country has its own, um, its own lost generation in a way. Um, what, I what is your, your uh, perspective in the light of the 2011 protests and the, um, on, the, on the youth of Bahrain at the moment? How do you see their, their future? Well, in 2011, people could uh, speak about their dream. Uh, they could uh, speak or they could imagine that things could be happen. A revolution that we have seen in uh, Tunisia and the successful uh, transition towards democracy have encouraged a lot of people in my country who lived uh, under uh, repressive uh, system. We have a, a minister or prime minister for the past 45 years, and we have the same minister that you can't criticize. We have laws that does not respect the human rights. We have a judiciary that does not uh, respect international uh, standard for uh, fair trial. So we, a lot of people like my, me, myself, have uh, lived uh, sometime abroad. And now with the new communication, with the new TV station, we could see CNN, we could see BBC, that we could not do that 30 years ago. So we could test and see how you guys working and enjoying democracy and system that, so that has a spread kind of uh, awareness among people that we have right also to enjoy democracy. We have right also to enjoy justice equality, freedom, liberties. So we start struggling. Uh, but the reaction from the repressive uh, government, I'm just trying to talk on Bahrain, but if you look at it's the whole region. Uh, the reaction was very bloody, very costly, that we, we did not expect that reaction. Uh, now, most of people who were heading the protest uh, in jail, many of them were killed. Many of them tortured, and they are not anymore normal people. Tens of thousands of people were wounded, and uh, they are not living their normal life anymore. Thousands of people kicked out of their job, of their school, of their university. The cost is so high, but the determination is higher. People did not stop. As I'm speaking to you, I have not stopped. I was uh, 30 months in solitary confinement by myself, talking to myself, and also or to people that I don't speak their language. I spent years, two years behind bar uh, as a punishment first in solitary confinement, but then when I complained, they brought uh, many prostitutes with me in jail. So I spent over a year with many prostitutes in jail. So government thought that it's a punishment, they punish me. But in fact, I have grabbed these opportunities and I have started teaching those uh, men prostitutes teaching them human rights, teaching them English language, teaching them Arabic language. And I always turn negative things to a positive thing. The same thing I'm trying to change the uh, violent reaction of the government and to a positive thing, to more determination towards changing the black or the sad reality that we are living in. As much as I see repression, as much as I get more determined, that situation sh should not continue. And we have to put an end to human rights violation. We do, we are human beings, as you are human beings in Europe. You are enjoying democracy, we deserve democracy. You are enjoying human rights, justice, we do deserve that. But we need to fight for that. We need to fight, we need to continue fighting peacefully uh, for that. And that could be very costly. 
and we did pay high price and we could pay much higher price in the coming days and months. But we have to continue. It's one way ticket. No going back. And this is what we're trying to create. Awareness. Awareness of human rights. Awareness of uh, justice. Awareness of equality. Fairness. Uh, independent judiciary, uh, 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 police system that respects human rights. This is what we are doing on a daily basis. Well, I'm not uh, free as much as I do talk before because uh, I'm under huge pressure. I'm under huge pressure. I'm being called every time, interrogated, and I have a case which I could end up very soon, spend another 10 to 15 years. In jail. It forced two things. I was jailed for two things. One, about a tweet, mm -hmm. I criticized committing torture by police. Two, about uh, criticizing the war on Yemen. Two tweet, I spent months in jail and I still have the case pending, which I could spend another 10 to 15 years. I have a colleague of mine who criticized the war on Yemen only and he was sentenced to five years. So this is the situation. You, you seem still un under all this. You seem to be still quite quite positive about the future. Are you? It, it, it seems as if it doesn't do much to you. Is that is that right? Well, I said to you. As I told you, it is a one-way ticket. Once you, you take, once you are on a track towards, uh, once you start to struggle towards achieving a value, moral, moral values, principles, and justice and equality, you don't look back. You don't look back. And once you go back, the cost is going to be higher. Once you started, you should continue. You should continue and you should convince as many people as possible internally and externally on the goal you are fighting for. That is one of the reasons why I'm talking to you now. Because uh, we are paying high price, not because our government bad only, because the European country choose to be quiet and silent also in what's happening. Because the European country choose to continue their businesses with those repressive regime. The, the U.S. and government have their business and arm sales and oil business and investment, they see that uh, have uh, more values than the values, moral values that their nation being built up upon. Someone from the audience maybe that uh, would like to ask a question. If not, I'll stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe it's better. Yeah, um, we've got someone from the audience uh, uh, that wants to ask a question. Hello. At least we see one. <laughs> oh. uh, Go hi. <laughs> Wolfgang is my name. I'm just uh, from the around the corner from Germany and uh, in Amsterdam for some days. Uh, so it's very admirable uh, to hear you talking about uh, your uh, fight for uh, liberty. I have a question uh, referring to the events uh, five years ago. Um, in the reports in Europe, it was basically um, explained as a protest of Shia population against uh, the ruling family, which is Sunni. Is this, in your eyes, is this a basic conflict or in what extent is it, is it a conflict between uh, longing for liberty against a dictatorship which if this is the main focus that would mean maybe that there are also Sunni people participating Did you get well, this is okay I got it this is the way uh, this is the way you, uh, this is the way my government and try to present it to the international community 
and to the neighboring country. Reason behind that, because Shia are minority in the Muslim world. They are minority in the Arab region and they are minority in the Gulf region. By, uh, by presenting it as a Shia Sunni dispute, the government could mobilize all the Sunni nation and Sunni government behind it. That was a smart move by the government by presenting it as a Shia and Sunni uh, uh, conflict. But at the same time, you have to take something into consideration. The majority of the population are Shia in this country. The marginalized group on this country are Shia. Discrimination being practiced against Shia. Marginalization being practiced against Shia. The Shia in this country, although they are the indigenous population of this country, and they represent two-thirds of majority, but their number, their percentage on the army are zero percent. That itself explains to you how the Shia have been treated. On the government institution, in the military and police institution. So the Shia are marginalized, made poor, made homeless, made jobless. So that's one reason that made the Shia to be the majority of the protesters. I give you an example. In South Africa, those people who came out asking for liberty and freedom and equality were the black people. Because the black people were the marginalized group. So that's why they were ahead on the revolution in South Africa. It's the same thing on Bahrain. The Shia are the marginalized group. The, the conflict was not about religion. It was not about faith. I'm one of the guys. I'm a liberal, uh, respect all religion, got nothing to do with religion, secular, uh, got nothing to do with Shias, got nothing to do with Sunni. We're talking about freedom. We're talking about democracy. We're talking about justice. We're, calling, we're talking about laws that treat people equally. All what we are calling for, all what we are fighting for, it's an international standard for uh, human rights. We don't, uh, we are not fighting for a, a religious government, we are not fighting for a Shia government, and we are not fighting against Sunni and Shia. We are fighting for respect for human rights. We want government that respect people regardless of their religion, their sect, their ethnicity, or their political background. Again, the government presented in the Shia and Sunni because this is the way they could mobilize the whole Sunni nation, Sunni government behind them, until a certain extent they succeeded in doing so. I would, I would love to hear, to hear more of the conversation, but I'm... Um being slightly pushed uh, pushed for time because we have of course more people uh, people waiting um, I would I, uh, thank you for this uh, for the conversation sorry to uh, to cut it off this uh, this bluntly um, I, I would I would love to talk to you uh, talk to you more but um, so <laughs> there's an audience um, well, thank you, and, and we'll definitely, definitely talk some other time in the future. And good luck, good luck with your scholar. <laughs> time flies by. Uh, yeah, so um, let me get back to the presentation. All right, we can do this. Uh, yeah, so our next guest, um, yeah, you are in the middle. Our next guest is uh, Fatim Boucheri. Uh, she's from Bahrain, um, currently living in Amsterdam, uh, studying in Amsterdam, if I'm, if I'm right. Uh, yeah, get on, the, get on the stage.
Okay, I think he can do it. Um, yeah, so the theme is Lost Generation. Um, um, uh, f first, in what way are you two uh, related? Well, Nabil is a family friend, long time, and he's uh, the best friend of my uncle. He's serving life sentence in prison right now. And they co-founded the Bahrain Center for Human Rights together and the Gulf Center for Human Rights. Uh, we, growing up, I was training at the center, so he was, he's like a father figure for us. And yeah, his family is close to our family. So the journey of human rights for both of us, both of our families was um, on the same path. Yeah, if I, I'm, I'm going to ask you the same question as I, as I did with him. Uh, yeah. Of course, the theme is uh, lost generation. Um, what's your What's your perspective on this as a, as a journalist? As a journalist or as a Bahraini, what is the difference? Uh, yeah, both. <laughs> well, I mean, Nabil doesn't look so lost. That's good for him. But um, for for us, the people like between the 20s and the 30s, it's really difficult because now there's a brain drain in Bahrain, and most of the people who were active or wanted to speak about human rights or <coughs> politics, um, had to either, you know, went to prison, like he mentioned, or were killed, mm. um, or were silenced, or like myself and other colleagues are outside in exile, or d just didn't go back. And that includes many journalists that I personally know who either switched careers uh, to something that's not really political, or are working for um, international you know, organizations that not in Bahrain. And um, it's even working outside is hard because even as a journalist, I can't really talk about Bahrain in any, if I'm not a freelancer especially, it's hard mm -hmm. to cover Bahrain because there's conflicts of interest. And like Nabil was mentioning that um, there's a lot of um, allies and ties between um, even media outlets, depending on which country, and they're more careful. Um, in terms of, like also he said, unemployment, everybody who participated in the protests uh, whether journalists or not, young or old, uh, bear the consequences later, and they did not know that they will pay that price. So a lot of them either lost their jobs, um, a lot of the students who were on scholarships uh, lost their scholarships, um, and those who were in prison obviously lost their education. So in that sense, you know, the people who are in Bahrain are lost in that sense because um, also they were punished and they're not being hired, for example. Um, they're not, like one of my cousins was talked about that as a nurse, and um, she graduated and she has to get her license from the Ministry of Health and they refused to give it to her because of her father's work. So a there's a lot of examples like that. Students who yeah. you know, didn't get what they want and they're just either unemployed or waiting for some miracle. Or the rest of us who are outside who um, have minimum opportunities outside and can't really go back or, or do anything mm. back. So it's this um, constant situation of limbo where you don't know what's next or you're either stuck inside or you're outside but also stuck in, yeah. in a sense. Because that's, that's what counts for you, right? Or, or yeah. Your, your case basically, uh, yeah. you cannot go back to, to Bahrain. No, no, not at the moment. Um, as a journalist and also because of the work of my, of my family, um, it, it's hard to... It's also unpredictable. Sometimes there are mm -hmm. cases against you, like Nabil and other people. So the government would um, make it obvious that you're, you know, have a pending case. But also it's unpredictable because so many people would go back and would get arrested from the airport. And myself, I've written, especially in the past two years, I've become more active in writing about human rights and my colleagues who have been tortured in, in prison. Mm -hmm. And I've received many um, death threats via phone calls, anonymous phone calls, and my mom received them on my behalf. So. It's tricky. While you were here in Amsterdam as well. While I was in Denmark, actually, mm -hmm. last year before mm -hmm. Amsterdam. And it continues. I actually wrote um, an elaborate article about a, a colleague and a friend who's a human rights um, activist and actually Nabil's cousin um, about his torture. And he was arrested and was tortured. And I wrote um, the details of his torture. And that's when the death threats started and you know all kinds of stuff, actually. And so it's risky to go back just because just think of it practically we don't need more people in prison but more people out that can speak about what's going inside because now for us who are outside we're the voice for the people who are inside um like nabil was saying he's taking the risk talking and that's what he does you know he's one of the few people who are very outspoken but a lot of the people who did speak and went to prison and then came out 
didn't want to talk again because of the brutal portrait of this human side. So in a sense, it's our responsibility, the ones that are outside, to take that, you know, both and amplify it and yeah. spread it and, and yeah. put it, you know. Because um, you, cause you studied, you did your two bit of your life history. You did a BA in um, in Washington, then moved to Denmark and, and Amsterdam, both. And now you're doing an MA in uh, journalism as well, right? Media and politics. Media yes. and politics, yeah. Yeah, I did my bachelor's in Chicago and uh, then yeah. in journalism and yeah, then okay. worked in D.C. for um, ah, yeah, TV yeah. stations, which was also problematic even though it was in, in the U.S. and we couldn't see much on Bahrain actually mm -hmm. because of the allies uh, between the U.S. and um, Spain. And yeah, and then now I'm doing the master's. Yeah. What's, your, what's your plan? What's your plan after your study? Yeah, everybody asks me this question and my answer is always don't ask me this question <laughs> because <laughs> I have no idea. Absolutely no idea. I mean, the, the goal is to um, find ways to stay, to do something, because mm -hmm. I can't go back, and um, it's not smart to go back. And you know, I want to continue to be active in journalism and human rights. And again, the only way to do that is to mm -hmm. be outside. All of my journalist friends inside have been tortured or imprisoned and then left, or they're not talking about them, which is it's just not the best way. So yeah, in terms of plans, I, I actually have no idea. I'm definitely going to be talking about Bahrain. I'm definitely trying to be more active in, in human rights um, because of the few number of us that are outside, that are young and need that fresh blood, that might be my plans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and b but you're, you're, already, uh, you're already working there. Are you publishing inside Bahrain as well? Because there's no, no, no free press? No, yeah. Uh, so your voice is not heard locally? No. No, locally, uh, we have the most of the media's own state state owned, mm -hmm. and uh, that includes broadcast. Actually, broadcast is only state owned, and then we have about three, uh, two English newspapers and like three to four Arabic newspapers. They're all influenced by the government in the sense, like also Nabil explained, maybe not owned, but um, uh, the top managers are, are either appointed by by the government or have close yeah. ties with them. And the only independent newspaper is Al Wasat newspaper, and it's just in Arabic, so it's very local, and it doesn't really reach the outside world outside of the region, at least. Yeah. And it has been harassed and shut down, suspended several times. One of the founders was actually detained and then um, released to dead body from prison. And the journalists journalists who work for that paper are also harassed. One of them left to Washington, so th there's no no sense. I mean, to write for publication inside the country because what we need is to also pressure governments outside of Bahrain and, and send the message outside to pressure our government to change their ways and, and yeah. stop the human rights violations. So I think that's more my role. Even growing up, I've always wanted to be the bridge between Bahrain or the region and the West. And th this is what we exactly need right now. Yeah, yeah. It's the necessary bridge between us. That explains probably also or why there's so sparse coverage of this uh, the 2011 protest journalists being incarcerated yeah. or sent sent away yeah um yeah to quickly uh, to quickly refer to the the shia sunni uh, sunni yeah. question because it's it's quite interesting <coughs> indeed um it's been really really framed as such what's what's your your perspective on it yeah i mean this is a question that we get all the time um at some point it gets really frustrating because it it, it really it shows a reality that's not the reality that we see I you know, in Bahrain. And like Nabil also explained, this is a very, very old tactic by the government, the divide and conquer tactic where, like he said, to mobilize most of the people, you um, alienate the marginalized group and make it the us versus them, basically. And um, the Shia Sunni divide in Bahrain specifically was never religious, it was more political or you know, socioeconomic where the Shias are discriminated against um, in, in jobs and employment um, and in rights. And that's where the problem started. But like also he explained, it happens to be that the majority of the Bahraini population is Shia, not anymore actually because of the political naturalization. It changed the demographics um, between the Sh Sunnis and the Shias. But um, it was never religious. It, it was more political and, and it just helped that the government played a lot of um, paid a lot of public relations companies outside to repeat that rhetoric to to make the world believe that it's you know the Shias the Sunnis and then the international players like Iran for example is problematic and 
because the U.S. has a problem with Iran, it helped that they connected the Shia movement in, in Bahrain to Iran. And then with Syria also and Yemen, you know, Iran has medal meddled in these conflicts um, in their own way. So it was easy for the government. It's such an easy way to connect the two <coughs> and, and make the world believe that it's the Shia versus Sunni. Whereas it's just, it was a very national movement and everybody was involved. It just happened to be that there were more Shias than Sunni involved. But there's also Shias who are with the government and work for the government who are not part of the movement. So it's really not about the sect. It's more <coughs> about are you with an oppressive regime or are you with democracy and more rights? So yeah, it, it's not what, um, the media is not really doing a good job, and I myself have been really upset with several uh, media outlets when they try to identify activists as a Shia or Sunni, like Nabil, you know, like Shia activist, Bahraini Shia activist Nabil, and I kept saying, why do you have to refer to him as a Shia or Sunni or Muslim or secular or anything? He's a Bahraini activist, and that was very problematic with, with the media, but we also know that the media wants to sell, and, you know, whatever triggers attention, that's what they're going to do. How strongly is this uh, this actually shared within uh, within Bahrain? I mean, at, at, at the protests, and also we, we saw it briefly, I think, in the in the trailer of the of the film. There's mm -hmm. also Sunni doctors, uh, Shia doctors. The, the they must have some sense of um, um, of uh, of reality in that sense, you know, that knowing that it's not fully true. Is there any action against this uh, this framing by the government? What do you mean action against? The well, government? like, uh, is, it, is there, is there, uh, so to say, a counter frame uh, that tried to actively oppose the Shia Sunni uh, opposition, trying to do something against it? Um, by the government? No, or by, by the people. By the yeah, people, no. yeah. Well, I mean, within Bahrain, it's very difficult, like mm -hmm. I said, because there's only state media. And if, if what you did not see in the documentary, if, if you would watch it, is that the state TV during that time used a very sectarian rhetoric where they, it was not even journalism, they um, kept saying, you know, the Shias, Iran, you know, like uh, foreign um, hands are meddling. And it was really hard when you don't have other sources or when you're not used to um, seeking international media, that's all the information you get. It, it was hard for, for people inside to counter this, this argument. But they did try, they did talk to Al Jazeera and you see a lot of the activists in the, in the documentary mm have talked to international media, they kept on saying it's a national movement, you know, we're Sunnis and Shias together, we're Bahrainis together. But then again, you have a government that is very resourceful, that has a lot of money, and is backed by Saudi Arabia, by the Gulf, by the US, by the UK, some Western countries, other Western countries, and, and they have the money to, to um, you know, employ, hire public relations companies that do a really good job of covering up all of it. So it's, it's hard to put us both on the same level, a resourceful government and a movement that has, you know, very limited resources. Most of them are in exile. We only have social media, like Nabil said. And even that is not always open, you know, because you get punished for saying uh, whatever it is that criticizes the government. So, yeah, I mean, the channels where we can express that and send the truth is, is limited and narrow compared to their rhetoric and, and you know, the policies that they have. And I it's, it's tough because even people from the Middle East, even people from Syria, I've talked to a lot of, um, Syrians who are my friends and you know in Syria it's the opposite of Bahrain in Syria the dictator is, is an Alawite who's closer to Shia and the majority who are protesting are Sunni and, and it's problematic because then the Syrians are also not supporting Bahrain in the revolution because they connected with the dictator that has been oppressing them mm -hmm. you know and so it's, it's paradoxical and even that conversation with people who have gone through oppression and who have experienced torture and and you still can't connect with them and explain, but you know we've gone through the exact same thing. We've gone through. Uh, we we want the same rights, the same you know demanding for the same kind of um, political system, but you don't understand it. I can't explain it to you, even even though you've gone through it. So imagine trying to explain that to people who have not really been part of the movement and who are not connected, yeah. including the rest. Yeah, 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 exactly. What's your prospect of the of the future of uh, Bahrain? Especially after the 2011 uh, protests. Well, it's hard to predict the future of Bahrain, but um, it, it's really hard to have a political future when there's so many s like ground roots human rights violations taking place. Because for Bahrain to be able to move forward, um, even politically, not just you know human rights, first you need to release all of the political prisoners to even 
have a chance at having a political dialogue um, or a national dialogue that moves towards reconciliation and um, you know just reshuffling a little bit of like some political reforms. But with the way that things are going on in Bahrain compared to 2011, I mean, yes, the protests are not as big and massive just because there's like like more crackdown. But um, the oppression turns into like legal, uh, you know, legal matters. So now there's instead of them just prosec uh, going out of the streets and killing people or shooting at people, they're prosecuting them legally. So in that sense, it's hard to see a positive note, f you know, for for Bahrain with um, you not when there's a law that actually prevents you from uh, practicing your right in terms of freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Um, First, the human rights violations need to stop, and then we can talk about maybe possibly having, you know, some sort of a decent future if uh, if you know that that happens. But definitely not in the next five years. I don't think that's going to happen. I think. I mean, I I sound pessimistic, I know, but it's just I feel realistic. A, lo a lot less than. Uh, a lot less. Yeah, yeah but Nab Nabil's job is to mobilize people. He his job is to you know yeah. he's the icon of the revolution, and people believe in him, and he. Yeah. He's the one who used to be in the front lines of the, the protests and people were behind him. But um, for us, I mean, for me, talking about the lost generation, to also be realistic and actually start planning my life, it's not thinking that, oh, it's all flowers and I'm going to go back. It's not, that's not going to yeah. happen. I, we all have to find other ways to you know, survive and still talk about that. I mean, he's in Bahrain. It's a different situation. He's going to be there. He's going to stay there. They have to continue that fight within some from within. And I think a lot of people in Bahrain believe that Although we need the help of international governments because of the nature of the relationship between the Western governments and the Bahraini government, mm -hmm. the arms sales and all of that, but still also change needs to come from within. And that's not just, in my opinion, it's not just political, but it's also social in terms of also communism and, and moving forward and um, you know just healing also from all of this mess yeah. the past five years. And yeah. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, is there someone from the audience that has a question perhaps? What about the other countries? I mean, uh, you're part of the GCC, yeah. uh, and you're the only uh, country who have uh, experienced such uprisings. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look to the uh, situation in the other countries, you see that there's a, lo uh, uh, a small minority who has all the power, who's the most uh, wealthiest, uh, and the biggest majority is coming from abroad, uh, Asia, uh, some African countries who are just working there. Is mm -hmm. it because there's so such a big difference that these uprising didn't um, um, happen over there, or why only in Bahrain and not in the other yeah. uh, five countries? Well, first of all, Bahrain uh, compared to you know the GCC, um, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Oman, and Kuwait. Bahrain is, um, has always had an active civil society since the 1920s, so they've always been active in politics and, and human rights to a sense. And this is not the first time they've they've had an uprising in Bahrain. We've practically had an uprising every 10 years. And then it just happened to be also inspired by the Arab Spring. The difference between Bahrain and the other GCC countries is obviously they're all rich countries, but um, the governments or the royal families, I'll say, did a better job um, in terms of um, empowering the locals and giving them back more, like especially even in money and um, the income. Um, for example, the United Arab Emirates, the locals are almost a minority compared to the foreigners. So they get a lot more benefits. They get more from the government. And so they're at this um, content mode where they feel like w that we're fine. We, you know, we have education, we have health care, we have money. There's nothing, you know, we don't need rights. You know, and that, that's a discussion actually had happened between activists from Bahrain and, and other people, um, you know, in the GCC countries. Um, whereas in Bahrain, the gap, the economic gap was huge, and um, there's the, the people got less from from our government. I mean, the royal family is extremely rich. The prime minister is uh, one of the richest people in the world, and he's been serving for 44 years. So he's the only prime minister we've had. Other countries try to give back, like in terms of even um, you know grants or like scholarships. But even the scholarship system, scholarship system in Bahrain is messed up. So in that sense, I mean, I think they're more content than other countries. They're more relaxed. They don't feel the need to fight for human rights and democracy. They're just relaxed and they're fine, with the exception of um, 
part of Saudi Arabia that's closer to Bahrain, they've seen some uprisings and revolts um, after Bahrain started to protest. And they've been brutally cracked down too because they're Shia again, and they were the, major the minority in Saudi Arabia. Um, Kuwait has an active civil society, but they've also, the government is more responsive. The government is, they don't have the Shia Sunni divide. Bahrain is the only country in the GCC and that region where it has a, a huge Sunni Shia divide, like Nabil explained, that is problematic because it clashes with every other royal family or government in, in that region and it's not in their interest because again, the c they connect it to Iran. So, so I guess that's why I answered your question. <laughs> Uh, will uh, decrease? Um, do you think these governments uh, are still? Uh, it is still possible to keep their uh, uh, populations happy by uh, giving them some uh, privileges. Um, I mean, uh, for, for the next few years, yeah, I think so. I and mean, there's a lot of speculations that um, maybe in ten or twenty years they're not going to last because of that. Um, I mean. Yeah, maybe it will slowly go down and decrease. But there's also allies like the U.S. and the U.K. and the West. I mean, they contribute a lot and they play a big role in this whole, you know, dynamic. So they support the governments. They're backed by them. But yeah, they can keep it going for a few years. I, in my opinion, I don't think it's going to last more than 20 years because it's going to be problematic at some point. Yeah. And uh, it, it sounds a bit like uh, like offering the people sort of like um, uh, bread and games, uh, which Bahrain didn't do and the other countries uh, did. Has, has it gone after uh, 2011 a little bit, like to offer offer the people ev even a, a, a sort of like a facade of, of? No, no, they did that right before, because you know, uh, there was, everybody knew the date, it was February 14th where people mm -hmm. are gonna go out in Bahrain and protest. So the government knew this was coming before that, they um, gave out, I think, like 1,000 BD, which I d looks like around 3,000, I think, US to families. And it was a way to kind of buy their silence, you know, before that. And th they do that sometimes. But um, after the revolution started, I don't think they had time for that. Everybody was, you know, protesting and it was a mess. But one of the techniques that they do is um, imprison people and then release them a little bit earlier or drop the charges and say, look, we're nice, we let them go, you know, even though they broke the law and they criticized us, but mm. we're just going to forgive them. And that's a way where they make people feel like, oh, you know, th they did us a favor and, you know, we should be thankful for that. And especially those who are not very involved in human rights are not aware of their own rights. And that was more, um, it worked more back then. But like Nabil said, after the revolution, people had more awareness of what human rights are, what our rights are, especially the people who are against the government or more, um, not the elites, because the elites, you know, obviously live a comfortable life, they're not part of this, but um, there is more awareness now and it's hard to buy their silence. Yeah. Um, the ones who were silenced um, went through like severe torture for them to be silenced. But um, these tactics in Bahrain at least doesn't work that well, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, more questions from the audience? Yeah, thanks very much for uh, joining us today. Um, so as I understood you, uh, the future looks rather grim um, in terms of human rights protection uh, and democracy. But uh, I was wondering um, strategically if, uh, so you, you explained us, um, first step would at least be to have at least a certain improvement in human rights standards. How can this be? Is there any way of, or any perspective how this can change in the future? Is it either by external pressure uh, by changing the mindset of countries such as the US, uh, the UK, the Netherlands, or is it, uh, is it through, is the only way a revolution, or is it rather through incremental change uh, over time, also by the, those in power? Um, how do you, what's your view on that? Well, like I said, and like I think many human rights activists believe as, you know, if I'm gonna speak as a human rights activist and part of an organization, um, we all fight for first stop the violations um, and then we can talk about, you know, political and civil rights and reform because, you know, even if we wanna have an election, I mean, the people when they went out first, they were demanding for, they were asking for an elected government or constitutional monarchy and, um, for that to happen now, first they need to, to release the 3,000 political prisoners. 
for them to sit and have a conversation and talk about what, what are the next steps. And then should there be elections, then there would be um, people from the opposition who are also involved and can be nominated and can hold office or can be involved in the political process. And then from there, we can, from, from within, I'm talking only about inside Bahrain. And then we can have influence in like reform and political change and like changing the laws a little bit once we have these people from the opposition, these thinkers, um, part of it. Right now, the 13 prominent thinkers and leaders are in prison, sentenced to between 15 years to life. Um, in terms of from outside, and that's what we work on as human rights who are living abroad, is to um, lobby, basically talk to policy makers and lobby um, for them to pressure the government to um, improve the human rights situation in order to continue the deal. So for example, even with arms sales, we've tried to pressure the US several times and other countries to freeze, and that happened, to freeze arms sales until the government um, of Bahrain improves the way they deal with, with the protesters and not use these weapons against the protesters on the ground. So I mean, even outside, it works when there's international pressure, not only by policymakers, but also by um, human rights organizations like Amnesty International, um, Human Rights Watch, Human Rights First. As much as it sounds repetitive and redundant, and some people think it might not be hel helpful, it did help in several situations where um, activists were released from prison. So the outside world helps with releasing people and just putting a spotlight on Bahrain. The media also, it would be very helpful. And policy making is um, in the underground, behind the scenes in terms of trying to talk to, um, like for example, the Dutch ambassador of human rights was in Bahrain recently and he was visiting the royal family. And so, so talking to uh, people like that and, and finding out what the reality that they see there and explaining to them the other side of the story is, is what we try to work on, hoping that it would create some sort of pressure. Um, in Bahrain, they have to continue to fight the way that they are and speak up and try to connect with us who are outside um, and hoping for, for the release. I think the first step is to release the prisoners. Everybody keeps talking about that, even in reconciliation, even in healing. I mean, those who've lost their sons or mothers or brothers, they're gone, but at least the political, political prisoners to be released, I think that's the first step to even consider any any steps forward after that. Is there, is there a thrust for us, like as, a, as the audience, can, can we do something? What can we do to to, e to help or? Well, I mean, <laughs> events like this, is, it's very yeah. helpful. We're trying to, um, for me, based in Amsterdam and the other my other colleagues who are based in Europe, we try to have more events and more discussions <coughs> because the critical um, situation is not only action, but people are not even aware about Bahrain, like in the Netherlands or in Europe. They know a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people know about the Formula One in Bahrain, for example, but not much about what's happening. So before we can get to like trying to find a strategic way to, to put pressure is first spread awareness and let them know Bahrain, where Bahrain is on the map, what's going on, and then find the connection between Bahrain and the Netherlands, for example, or Bahrain and Germany, and Bahrain you know, and France, and see what, what, the, what their government has done to help our government. And then um, connect with human, like the local human rights organizations, which is what we've been trying to do, and find ways to collaborate in, um, in terms of organizing events, in terms of putting us in touch again with policymakers, um, and just you know the journalists abroad are also very helpful. I mean, I'm a journalist, but I can't write in the Dutch media. I can't speak to the Dutch people. Um, so connecting with journalists from other countries who can find that link and put it in the media is also very helpful. All right. Um, I would like to end with one question. Um, it might be it might be a difficult one. Maybe it's not. Uh, what what do you what do you consider the most promising uh, which is happening right now in in Bahrain? <laughs> I have to think about it for a second. What's happening? I mean, in terms of laws or I think yeah, I don't know. Yeah, promising developments. I think uh, the developments from the government side is not very promising. That's the only thing that I, I try to, you know, because a lot of people say it's unsuccessful, you know, we didn't really achieve what we wanted to do in Bahrain, unlike, I mean, it's even controversial in Tunisia and Egypt, but we didn't really get what we wanted yet. But still, the level of awareness has been changed and has been, like, it's rising by, you know, the day. 
and you see a lot of people now knowing more about human rights and since the human rights movement in Bahrain gained momentum since 2011 and now it's even stronger um, a lot of us are younger people you know I mean um, in their 20s or 30s we've been able to connect with the Bahraini people and now they're more aware of what their rights are and they can't go back and also part of the documentary that we didn't see someone was talking about how the people have touched the freedom while they were protesting and there's no going back now they can't go back to what it was before because they know what it feels mm. like they know uh, they've seen the surrounding countries they can compare to um, the outside world and the west and and that's something that is very precious that's something that we hold on to as you know like hope to move on you know later because even if political reform has not been, been implemented yet, at least that's something we can use in the coming days. So the level of awareness is definitely something that I find promising and that we credit to the, the uprising for, and maybe it also has to do with the Arab Spring as a whole. But other than that, yeah. <laughs> I guess it's clear. Okay. Well, thank okay. you. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. What made you uh, trust that uh, the revolution or changes in the country will not turn into chaos and violence that we experienced in the time after the Arab Spring? Well, for once in Bahrain, unlike, for example, Libya or e Egypt or other or Syria, is that um, we don't have arms. Like the people don't have access to arms. It's just the government. It's just the you know the, the army, the police that has access to arms. So, and that's why you don't see it. It's one of the most peaceful revolutions. Now we call it an uprising in Bahrain is because if we wanted it to be violent back then, they could have, if, you know, and, and that's also an answer to why Iran is not involved because if they really wanted to be violent, they could have gotten weapons, you know, from Iran. And uh, there are people who are ready to support. So they've already proven for five years after they've been oppressed for five years, killed, prosecuted, they have not really um, used violence like it's been used in other countries. And I think that track record speaks for itself that it's not going to turn to violence afterwards. And the people don't want, you know, th their demands are not unrealistic. Y once you have everybody working together and have an elected government, there's, not, there's little chance for it to be violent. I mean, obviously, I can't guarantee and say there's going to be, you know, no chaos because I don't think there's any revolution that that was a smooth transition into, you know, peaceful and good political system. But violence and, and war inside Bahrain is unlikely just because of, of the structure of Bahrain and the society. And it's not, um, a lot of people thought they were comparing it to Syria and like possible civil war between Sunnis and Shias. But again, there are no arms. The only people who have arms are the people who have ties with the government. And ev again, in the documentary, um, if you choose to watch it, you'll see that um, the people who went out to the pro roundabout had zero arms, but then the counter, the opposition of the opposition, so the people who supported the government had their own protest, but then they were carry carrying arms and guns and all kinds of, of weapons. So in terms of from the opposition side, it's, it's not violent, it hasn't been violent, and, and the very few incidents where you know they've used Molotov cocktails like others has, has been mostly peaceful. All right, I would like to leave it with this because we've got a Skype conversation with Tanya. Yep. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Thanks. <laughs>